Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd, and today we're going to be looking at the Hull to Bridlington branch, part of the Hull and Selby Railway, and the last thing they did before handing over the torch to George Hudson. So in the last episode, we saw that the Hull and Selby Railway Company accepted an offer they couldn't refuse from the York and North Midland Railway under the control of George Hudson. But before they did that, they'd already planned and surveyed a line, a branch line, from Hull to Bridlington. And it was their responsibility to build it. So they did. And George Hudson managed to get himself on the committee for the building of the line to ensure that it met up with his own interests. You see, the York and North Midland Railway already had a stretch of line between Scarborough and Seymour, and he was going to build an extension to that from Seymour to Bridlington, and he wanted to make sure that that met up with the Hull to Bridlington line to form one continuous line all the way to Scarborough. And that's what happened. The line was built. He also managed to have the rather awesome coup of getting the fabled legend of a railway architect, George Townsend Andrews, to design most of the stations on the route, giving the whole track a kind of a unified stylistic theme. The line itself was built in 1845 to 1846, and in 1846 it opened. And this is the original stretch of that line, down that way towards Derry Coats. That line started here, at the old Manor House Street station, headed westwards, and at Dairy Cuts, split off from the Hull and Selby main line to head north, through the rural district of Newington, to head towards Cottingham, the first station on the line. But this line was bypassed with the opening of Paragon Station in 1848, and the construction of a new cord of track that linked Paragon to the Bridlington branch. The original track became known as the Newington branch, and was still used to ferry freight along the line until well into the 20th century. Up. In 1965 the Newington branch was closed and the track was lifted shortly thereafter. All the freight that had been going up the line to Bridlington and Scarborough was now being shifted by vans and lorries. There was no real need for this to exist, but it has left us with a lovely walk. All the way down there, towards Annaby Road, where it meets up with the Boothbury Road roundabout, across Spring Bank, to here, quite literally, the end of the line, because just through that field is where it used to junction with the connecting cord from Paragon Station. And where now, that is the only Hull to Bridlington line. But there was a station on this route, the Newington branch, one single station called the Newington Excursion Station. And it was tiny, uh, literally two wooden platforms either side of the track, just south of the Annaby Road level crossing. And it didn't even have a ticket office. There is a local legend, an urban legend, that says that it was built in the 1890s so that uh, the wife of a local merchant could hop on the train whenever she wanted and go to do some shopping. But I couldn't find anything in the histories to substantiate that. What I did find, however, is that the station was used a lot for animals, for moving livestock to and from agricultural fairs in Hull, things like Hull Show. And I also found that it was opened once a year, especially to bring people in to Hull Fair because of course it was only a short walk up Anlaby Road to the fairground. But whatever its origin story, Newington 
an excursion station. It was closed officially in 1913. And it certainly has gone off the maps by 1920. The Bridlington branch is quite unlike any of the other railway lines in the East Riding. All the other lines thread their way through tiny agricultural hamlets and terminate either at a, an industrial location like Selby or at seaside resorts like Hornsey and Withensea. Of all of those lines, only the Holderness Railway passed through any significant towns, but Hedden's glory days were well and truly in its past, whilst Patrington's star was already beginning to fade when the railway arrived. The Bridlington branch, however, passed through the largest and most important towns in the whole of East Yorkshire. First amongst those stops was the town, or village, of Cottingham. Cottingham is an unusual place. Technically, it's a village, but it's bigger than most small towns. It has a rural character about it, and yet it's one of Hull's earliest industrial suburbs. It became a place in the 19th century for many people from Hull seeking to flee the increasingly toxic smog of Hull's industry. And Cottingham Station reflects this strange split personality of the place. It's part agricultural waste up, but also part town building. It doesn't have the covered roof of Bridlington or Beverley, but it does have a range of office buildings. It's a mishmash of different styles to fit the town. The village It's really a town. It's not, it's officially a village. Cottingham didn't really have a great deal of industry and the wealthy industrialists who came here to live in order to get away from the sound and smell of industry ensured that it remained so. There was a gas works and a sawmill around the station goods yard, and the gas works was replaced by the textile factory around the turn of the century. The goods yard, however, never really developed in the same way that it did at Beverley, for instance, and Cottingham Station's main business was in moving passengers, shuttling commuters into Hull to work, then back home for tea, a pattern that persists right up to the modern day. So today I'm in Cottingham, and this is the crossing just next to the old goods station. Now, interesting aside, I used to live in Cottingham when I was a teenager, and every day I would cross this crossing to go to school. And behind me, just here, there used to be a rusty old sign, a cast iron sign on a post that said Northeastern Railway, and it was a warning about trespassing. I'm pretty sure it dated from the 1920s. And I always loved it because it kind of, it was the first time in my teenage life that I'd recognised that actually places had a deeper permanence to them and it went back longer than the living memories of anybody I knew. It was a link to the deep past before British Rail, before the LNER. And one day I came to school and it was gone. Somebody had sawn it off the post and stolen it. And I was gutted. And then when I got home that night, it turns out that the person who'd stolen it was my stepdad and his eldest son. They'd come out in the middle of the night and sawn it off. He treated it, got rid of the rust, repainted it in black and white and stuck it in his back garden. That kind of annoyed me, even though I could see it every morning through my window. It should have been here, in its proper place, reminding countless generations of other teenagers of the permanence of history. Moving on up the line, the next stop was Beverley. This is the town that was for hundreds of years the heart of Holderness. Long before Hull was even Hull, Beverley was the region's political, economic and spiritual centre. Surrounded by magnificent medieval walls and housing a huge minster visible for miles across the flat fields of East Yorkshire. It's perhaps fair to say that Beverley was an important place for a very long time before it became eclipsed by Hull's rising star. It remained an important market town in the area, but was swiftly falling behind in these more industrial days. 
The transformation of Beverly Beck into a canal in the early 18th century, a shortened stretch of waterway that connects Beverly to the River Hull, helped Beverly to establish itself in a more modern way, and industry did begin to grow along the quayside. Shipbuilding, mills, tanneries. But ultimately the biggest professions in Beverly remained things like wheelwrights, ironmongers and leather workers. Beverly may have joined the Industrial Revolution, but it was still primarily rooted in its agricultural heritage. When the railway arrived here in Beverly, the town corporation welcomed it with open arms, even though it competed with the Beck, which they owned. Their hope was that the railway would breathe new life into Beverly's tiny industrial region to here in the east of the town. It never really did. Those industries had always been based around agriculture, such as leatherwork, for instance, and the woolen industry, and those were on the way in any way in this region. The main attraction for Beverly was in its charming medieval streets and its rural location. These appealed to a burgeoning middle class of whole people who were looking for somewhere more at market to live the country dream, away from the stifling and polluting chimneys of Hull itself. And that, to this day, explains Beverly's slightly split down the middle nature, with industry and cheap housing on the east, and upmarket places in the west. Beverly Station is one of the biggest stations on this line. In fact, it's one of the biggest stations in the region having a completely covered platform. Even the bridge that's integral to the station at the other end has a cover on it. And this reflects the fact that Beverly was a largish town with a decent sized population and a reasonable industry. And to reflect that industry, the goods yards were also much more substantial than any of the other locations on the line, perhaps except Bridlington. There were goods depots and warehouses to the north, to the south, and to the east of the station itself and a huge coal depot just to the west which is now a car park. Another piece of railway history that has disappeared from Beverly is the old Beverly to York line which split off from the Beverly branch here just to the north of the town and headed off towards the west through the world's towns of Pocklington and Market Wheaton before ending at York. The line was closed under the recommendations of the Beeching Report in 1963 and the track was lifted, although the stretch between Beverly and Market Wheaton is still accessible as a cycle track. Carrying on northwards from Beverly, the line passes through the tiny station of Arum and the disused station of Lockington. Interestingly, the station of Lockington was requested as a stipulation of the landowner, Baron Hotham, who wanted a station with a horse and cart kept for the exclusive use of himself and his friends. He also demanded that the Hull and Selby Railway Company not interfere with the sale of coal in the region, as he was engaged in something of a local monopoly. Further on, there's the village of Hutton Cranswick, once a very important agricultural village in the East Riding, and, after that, another junction to a long-vanished railway just south of Driffield, the Moulton and Driffield Railway. Driffield had long been an agricultural centre, a market town, and with the coming of the canal here, the Driffield Navigation, people would bring their wares to sell here so that they could be shipped via canal up to the rest of the country. And it was this agricultural nature that made Driffield very important when the railways arrived, because instead of having to use the slow barges along the canal, now they could ship stuff very, very quickly indeed from the station. As a station complex, Driffield was much smaller than Beverly, having only one goods station and a coal depot both to the west of the station. The coal depot is now a car park and the goods station has long since been demolished to make way for a housing development. The enclosed roof was also reduced to a pair of canopies on each platform. Moving on up the line are another string of small communities, Nafferton, Lowthorpe, Burton Agnes and Carnaby, but of these, only Nafferton survived a series of station closures in the 1970s. Eventually, the line reached Bridlington, where it terminated. 
but in the 1840s the question was which Bridlington shall we terminate it in? Because back then Bridlington was two settlements. There was the old town which was set back from the sea a few miles and which was the main population centre and there was the harbour which is where most of the trade was done but in terms of population was little more than a hamlet. The first plan was to build the line all the way out to the harbour but the people of the old town objected claiming well why do they get one? There's nobody living there. We want a station here so that we can get the train. And in the end a compromise had to be reached. The station was built within easy walking distance of the harbour and the old town, right in the middle. There was originally, in the 1850s, a branch that went down to the harbour, but that was lifted fairly quickly, uh, though it is still visible on the map in the shapes of some of the streets. The harbour branch was gone within only a few decades, but its route can still be seen in the curve of Windsor Crescent, where it ran behind the houses. Bridlington's station complex was the largest on the line with the exception of Paragon, and it had a substantial goods shed and warehouse, an engine shed and a carriage shed. A fitting station for a town this important to the northernmost reaches of the East Riding. Bridlington's port had been important since medieval times and it was just off Flamborough Head that one of the naval battles of the American War of Independence was fought between the Scottish-born American commander John Paul Jones in his ship, the USS Bonhomme Richard, and a convoy of British supply ships defended by the HMS Serapis. Bridlington has a long maritime history. By the 19th century though, imports had dwindled to merely importing coal and Driffield, with its new canal and closer proximity to the farming communities, had become the more important export centre for agricultural produce. Like Hornsey, however, Bridlington reinvented itself as a seaside resort for the well-to-do, a reinvention assisted by the discovery of a spa just south of the harbour in the 1730s. When the railway arrived, it had much the same effect as it had in Withensea and Hornsey, the harbour area grew and grew with guest houses, bed and breakfasts and hotels until by the 20th century, the harbour and the old town finally merged. And it was the harbour that was the senior partner. Bridlington was another of the east coast towns that became a firm favourite of trippers from Hull and from the massive landlocked west riding cities. The fishing industry, which had taken a huge nosedive, perked up again with the 25 fishermen of 1851 becoming over a hundred by 1891. Fish and chips wrapped in newspaper by the sea was quickly becoming a feature associated across the country with the seaside, and no self-respecting resort would be complete without fresh, locally caught fish on the menu. With the arrival of the railway, Bridlington prospered, and because the railway was never taken away, it didn't suffer the same contraction in its economy that Hornsey and Withensey endured and it remains to this day a prosperous and busy holiday destination. So the Bridlington branch was the last great hurrah of the Holland Selby Railway Company before it sold everything that it had lock, stock and barrel to George Hudson. But Hudson's future was not rosy. In only a few years time his fraud crimes would catch up with him and in the 1850s he was even forced to flee the country in order to avoid prosecution. What remained of his company was rolled into the North Eastern Railway and that created a few problems. You see, the North Eastern Railway owned, at that point in the 1860s, all of the railway lines into Hull. All of them. And that meant all the lines that fed the docks were dependent upon the North Eastern Railway. And the North Eastern Railway had already inherited some docks from its component companies, namely in Middlesbrough and Hartlepool, docks that competed directly with Hull. This culminated in 1872, when there was such a shortage of locomotive power that there was complete gridlock on Hull's railways. Hull trains full of fresh produce sat slowly going bad in the sidings, here at Priory Yard, for two days before engines were free to take them away. Angry accusations of sabotage were levelled at the North Eastern Railway, and whatever the reality of the situation, whether the NER was indeed engaging in underhand attacks on its competition, or whether it was just suffering from a shortage of locomotives, 
it began a ball rolling in Hull that would trigger the building of a brand new dock and the creation of Hull's last new railway, the Holland Barnsley Railway. But that's a story for the next episode. If you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to click like and subscribe. If you subscribe, you'll get notifications when I release a new video and it also helps the channel grow with YouTube so we can reach more people 